Um, what I, I might decide to do on the practice provides so obviously is very unique, and I'm going to chair the session. What I'm going to actually do though, I'm going to introduce the three speakers at the outset. Um, very kindly, the Minute University Social Science Institute is going to be for the event. So if I introduce the three speakers at the start, then John will give input, and then we have our two respondents, and we flow like a bit of conversation. But I'll come in after that then um, for a bit of QA. So what we might try and do is if we can shorten our inputs from the from the top here and allow some time for discussion, okay? Um, and my job is to keep it on time. So we'll aim to finish up for about four to four, because then I'll be like just no, no, just that's so, it. Um, yeah. So where you are. So by way of very, very good introductions, um, our first speaker is going to be Dr. John Bissett, the reason we're here today, to hear about John's new book, it's not where he is, how he is. So John would be well known as a community worker and community activist in Dublin, and well known at a national level um, as a campaigner and activist on many campaigns over the last number of decades. Maybe what John is less known for is his um, political capacity to read, write, research, analyze, theorize, and um, all those boxes he ticks into the full time academic. But John ticks all those boxes in his everyday work as a community activist and community worker. Um, and the work he has produced in this book, True That Academic Work in the Community, and um, set up his launch, the third speaker, um, Colin mentioned it's on par with some of the great ethnographic pieces of work in social sciences. And for anyone who's read the book or yet to read it, um, certainly when I read it, I would be really pleased with that. There. And I think that's a credit to the quality of John's um, skills as a researcher, but equally the process, which is important for us in this room as academics, because he was affiliated with UCD in the particular sport of Professor Kathy Lynch in School of Education. So it's important to note that. But um, equally, it was a piece of work produced in a working class community with the working class community. And that's really important in terms of, again, at the long term, we did that. Someone said to me, after that launch, I was in this room and actually led a different type of launch. And when I was thinking about what I said, it actually got me what he meant. And it was the sense the community was there, a real sense of ownership of this book and the data and the information and the findings in it. But it was a learning there, a kind of model for how we produce um, knowledge for communities that are excluded by geography or communities of interest to solve forward a really good model how John produces a piece of work. Um, so it's kind of fitting then that our two respondents, our academic respondents, our two academics that I believe, and I'm sure most of you associate, they always make that link and that bridge between what they do academically and why they're civil society. Um, and it's so, so for instance, that also prior to the academics, they were active in kind of community and the other sectors campaign and so forth. So our first respondent is Professor Mary Murphy, who probably doesn't need an introduction. Um, but uh, Mary's head sociology here in the and her work over the years has spanned through social welfare, various social policy areas, poverty, women, class, you name it. I know my work is in the NGO sector, well, for exactly, I would have been referencing Mary's work and all of that. So her, her work goes across many different areas. And her most and her portal of work and book on eco social feminism does overlap a good bit with some of John's pieces on class and gender. Um, and then our second speaker, Dr. Rory Hearn, again, possibly an introduction. Um, I think any academic on the Late Late Show can never need an introduction again. <laughs> but for those who missed the Late Late Show, um, Rory is a leading um, analyst and um, academic on heads and arms. His work uh, certainly uh, has formed not just civic organizations and NGOs, ordinary members of the public in terms of things that are passing, think about social policy and think about housing and their own experience of the housing crisis from a policy perspective. So his book Gaps is really accessible and really manages to do that because it's bridging academic understandings of policy to people's everyday experiences and linking the two together. Um, so it's fitting that we have uh, these two academics here today. Um, so yeah, I think without further delay, again, Rory's focus on public housing in particular in his analysis, not just analysis, but solutions around housing crisis, links in with a lot of John's work in this, around the importance of public housing in people's lives, people who are as well as people who are lives. So what I'll do now is I'll hand the floor to Dr. John Bissett, and then he'll be followed by a response from Professor Mary Murphy, and then Dr. Rory here, and then I'll come back for a bit of Q&A. Okay, thanks very much, Mags. Um, do I need a microphone? Can, 
Can you, can you hear me without it? I mean, without it's okay? Okay, good. Hope there's no echo. Um, okay, I probably want to do three things, which is talk about a bit where the book came from, a bit about what, the second bit about what it became, and maybe what use it might have. There, the sort of three things in my head. Um, Technology is fantastic for knocking off on you, isn't it? Um, so, um, yeah, so, and there's different parts of that story. But one of the parts of the story was that, um, like, some of us or a lot of us in community based work would use the arts. So, one of the ways into this piece of work was through photography, right? And, like, the photographs I'm going to show you, unless you've had a relation, lived there, maybe, <laughs> they're kind of, uh, non-identifiable photographs of the place. I think they would be, you could, they could be taken anywhere. So maybe I'll just show you some, some initial images that um, were taken by three brilliant photographers over a number of years. And um, we haven't done anything with the photography yet uh, at this stage, uh, because it obviously wasn't meant to go with the book because it would have identified the place, let's say, potentially. Um, because a lot of the photographs do identify the place, um, but they are just moments in time in working class dwellings about the decor, the furniture, um, the wallpaper, um, clothing and accessories. Um, yeah, so, um, so th that was a way for me the, the photography was a way to get conversations going with people. Some people didn't want their photographs taken, but on lots of occasions you could get a few photos and then you'd end up having a cup of tea and you start chatting with people. Um, and yeah, so that's, that, that's just a little uh, in, by way of introduction. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna knock this off because I have notes, but we were talking before the session on this thing about uh, whether, you can probably still all see them. I don't actually no, I think I'll probably do it now. Um, okay. So there's this massive screen here. So I'm sorry if I'm looking a bit this way to the people over on my right who are usually on the left a lot more. Um, so um, I, this re the book started in 2014. I had written a previous book called Regeneration Public Good or Private Profit. And it was just, that was really an immersion in the process of public-private partnership. Rory had written a book about five PPPs in Ireland, and we were all, a lot of us were immersed in that kind of thing for, for a good few years, where the city council in Dublin and the state and other places were saying the way to get projects done is to give them to the private sector. Um, so it was kind of macro level stuff, even though the ethnog that piece of work was a kind of similar uh, kind of consistently writing field notes of a process over three or four years and then saying, what structure can you put on this? Um, but the, in that piece of work, I didn't really get at what's it like to live here, for instance. What's it like subjectively um, for you at, at that level? You did talk to people a lot about, but uh, that wasn't really the focus. Um, so, I think one of the things that I've learned about me is that I'm quite an opportunistic researcher, that I'm kind of good at that, and that's what myself have talked about. So, like, I would try and bend my work into places where I probably am not supposed to be, let's say, and wait till somebody says you're not supposed to be there, right? Um, so, um, so this, this book came out of that desire to do research and to write it, even though traditionally you might not technically, legally uh, be allowed to do that in that position. So I would say research is a subversive act, okay? And I would encourage people to be subversive in their research approaches, as in if there are opportunities to do, to write and to research things, even though you think, oh, it's technically not part of my job description and somebody finds out, okay, there may be risks involved, <laughs> you might lose a job, okay, uh, think about that stuff, but um, so I felt something needed to be written about the people who lived in public housing at a kind of deeper level, um, as opposed to the more political campaigning work, so they're, they're, even though they're two sides of the, of the same coin. Um, so 
Mags obviously here, Mags was really important in UCD. There was a group of people there at the time. I don't know why, like I, my background is here. Like I, I studied here in Manute in the early nineties when there were good sociology teachers, I would say. <laughs> Michal and Liam. Um, so, um, but I went and did a PhD in UCD um, and I had kind of worked with Pat Clancy in education because I did a really, I think, a fairly bad PhD, um, but they gave it to me in, in, at the time. And I had met Kathleen Lynch and Mags on that journey. So I hooked, I linked back in there at that time just to say, I have these ideas and I'm starting to work on something. What do I do with them, right? Um, so th they were involved in a big education project at the time. So that was a, that, was a really important bridge, let's say, between academia and me as a community worker, uh, researcher, let's say. And the other big link that I made at the time was Colin Coulter, who's here today. I would have, Colin lives close to where I work. So we would have, like I don't know many times we've met in recent years, loads and loads of times just to talk through um, the intricacies of theoretical literature and class, doing basic things around research, uh, what, do if somebody does this or or you know kind of worries you might have at certain points so i applied it was Kathleen's suggestion i applied to uh the Irish research council and they gave me ten thousand euros i remember having to take a p45 from the job and i got a, effectively got a day a week in ucd but that really it was an opening of a window right so i was able to go there and officially one day a week go to the library and start beginning to get in touch with the literature uh, and lots of uh, just beginning to like lots of texts that you know about but you, you might not have read them so in, like probably my feel a lot of it would be called urban sociology right but it stretches off into other places so when I was a student I was reading William Foot White Street Corner Society um, Paul Willis is learning to labor, Angela McRobbie's books on young women in education, Phil Brown, I don't know whether anybody remembers school, uh, ordinary kids. Uh, so all of that sort of stuff, right? Uh, and then you get people like Lindsay Handy writing more recently about a book called Estates and Intimate History. Uh, you've got Lisa McKenzie, who's been here once or twice down in Limerick a couple of years ago, who wrote a book about St. Anne's in Nottingham called, uh, Estates uh, post in post austerity Britain. I got the exact title in a minute. Um, people like Like Wakant, who was Pierre Bourdieu's protege, who went to America and has written kind of tr a trilogy of really important texts. Pro probably, I don't I'm not sure it's the best, but Over and Outcast is one of the most uh, kind of critical of how we would understand an urban landscape in terms of, I think he has six different criteria but so there's there's kind of the field work research type books and then there's other books which I would have come across at the time Andrew Sayers book The Moral Significance of Class which was hugely influential in terms of opening a window into what I then later used in this book which is critical realist theory or sometimes called transcendental critical realism and there's a whole school of people in there Margaret Archer, Andrew Collier, Ted Benton um, and so on um, and all of that stuff, I think, in the end, brings you the philosophy, right? So, like, how, what, what is it that constitutes a public housing estate, morally, ethically, materially, and so on? Um, so, I've just uh, began to show. I just showed some of the photos, um, which I was going to do now, but because of the way the tech works, we'll do it slightly differently. Um, so. Part of my craft, I think, is writing field notes, right, from the get-go, just sitting down. So wherever you can do them, I don't know what research methodology classes people do here, but the basics for me, both in Minute and in UCD, Mary Corkin taught research methodology classes when I was here, and Betty Hillier taught them in Minute. But the basic constitutive element of any research ethnographic project are your field notes. You go, you spend two or three hours in a place, you go home, you write them up, you go to the office, you write them up, you go to the toilet, you write them up, whatever you can, you go, and eventually they become the kind of background paint colors for the whole project. So you go, all right, so Mary keeps telling me every week 
or she keeps going to the same place every week and she keeps doing the same things every week. And I, so every, every few sets of notes, the same theme comes up and it comes up again and again. So slowly you begin to build pieces of a jigsaw from those field notes. People like Mike Agar, who wrote a lot about kind of drug dealing in America would say, they're the beginning which leads you to the key questions, right? So then you go back and say, why is it that you go to the religious house every Wednesday? Why is it did you know that you started using heroin when you were 17? What happened at that time? And why, you know, what happened and, and so on and so on. So um so that um there in a way, just that if, I suppose they're just techniques and your methods and how you begin that process. So that that would have been my start off like with the photography and beyond it. With, uh, uh, alongside getting some money for time from the Irish Research Council, Patrick Lynch had some money for transcriptions, right? It might seem a fairly innocuous thing in universities where maybe that money's available a lot, but it was, no, okay. It wasn't really available to me, no, okay. So that money, so I could go and do 30 long recorded conversations with separate individuals and say, here's a few questions about what's it like to live here where did you go to school? What was education like? What work have you been doing? And work, I mean, both in what we would conventionally understand in a paid sense, but also the much deeper world of unpaid work, which is usually carried by women, and which became, which is a, a central core of the ethnographic chapters in, in the book. Um, so what begins to happen over a period of, I don't know, three, four, five years, you get stories, you get histories, you get textures, right? So you hear, where people came from, how they got to be in the Bridgetown estate. Um, so like the old story in Dublin would be that a lot of people came from the tenements, right? And there are some of those stories, but a lot of like, in a way, in a lot of Dublin estates now, you've got three or four generations. So the first generation, and a lot of them are gone. So people who would have moved into estates in the fifties with their young children, most of them have passed on and you've got uh, their children or their children's children and even the next generation after that again. Um, but So you begin to piece together the texture of lives, people's stories and, and so on. Um, so if you like, so you begin, if you think maybe there's a kind of journey through the, the ethnography, which is you begin with the photography, you begin with introductions, then you get people who say, yeah, I'll sit down with you and have a chat with you. Uh, and some of that stuff is fundamental to some of the chapters to record conversations. And then at some point on the research journey, I don't know, just, uh, there was a kind of, I'd met people in between all of that. So you're, it's not all in, you know, shipping container, binary, broken down. I met that group and then after, so you're, People are flowing through the space at different times. They're all at the same time. Um, so there was kind of, a, I used to go over to one particular part of the estate and I'd sit with people and they'd have a smoke, they'd have a cup of tea, they'd be chatting away. And then I used to see some of those people go out of the estate every week. And one day I said, I went up and said, where is all the, so they said, we're going down here. And they didn't say to the other place they called it, right? As it's called in the book. So I said, can I go? And they said, what do you want to go for? And I went, we'll just go along, which is, you know, I didn't know what to say, really. So they said, yeah, really, come on. So anyway, that began a kind of three-year set, set of relationships with about six or eight people. Um, and it's the later chapters of the ethnography in the book, Means Ends, um it's it's not where you live it's how you live what goes around comes around um where instead of like brendan marsh who's from dublin has a book out called the, the drugs in dublin the logic of violence and so i mean in qualitative research there's various places you can get to you can stay with the interviews you can stay with the observations or you can to varying degrees participate with groups of people in the activities that they do you can live with them eventually if, if that works right or you in this in my case i would have just spent afternoons evenings and sometimes weekends one of our trips was to knock right i'm not religious but it was a very interesting experience to go to knock and to listen to the priest sing elvis presley songs from multi farnham all the way to knock um and you're kind of going 
how did I get here? Um, but but you just you're on that journey with people, and you go you go the whole the whole hog. So what you so you learn learning different things as you're going along. Um, the kind of geographies, the streetscapes, where do people go? So you kind of go, I know the city. And then you go, no, like, but I never went there and I didn't do that and I didn't go here. So you're kind of keeping that open-ended, open-minded uh, approach to the thing. Um, so ju just in terms of, there's obviously the estate itself is critical to the whole, uh, like I was going to read a long passage there, but I'm not going to do it now. But um, if, the, so it's almost like, the, like one of the things I've learned from people like Lefebvre, and the geographers is the, the importance of the place, right? And how it structures, not just your, uh, your social being, but, it, but the architectonics of it, the way it is, the way it's structured. So for instance, one of the things that's changing in lots of public housing estates is that the open spaces are being quickly enclosed, let's say, when the council has money to do the job, they'll come along and go. Uh, so you used to have a very open plan and we know, we know, that that's causing antisocial behavior, right? So therefore we will give you a new design which gives you a fob where a small number of people can access their own apartment. Now, I'm not really arguing the thoughts on that today other than to say it changes the whole dynamic of how people live, how children interact with each other, how families interact and, and so on. Some people may go, oh, I absolutely love having the more private way of living, but, but the, Anthropological way, the, the estates were set up was very particular, especially in Dublin, like there's a, a Brian Brannigan played at the launch of this book, and he sang a song called The Long Balconies. And the long balconies are synonymous with the public housing estates in the city, because like you could come out and you could converse with your neighbors, either up, down, and the, like, I use the Foucault's example of the Panopticon. So the Panopticon has one central gaze, which watches everybody, okay? a la Jeremy Bentham, whereas the public housing estates had a multiple perspective of gaze where everybody could link with everybody else. So they're kind of architecturally a completely uh, socialized model of housing. But uh, so if you are really thinking architecturally, how could you keep that within the design? You might be getting somewhere. But anyway, so um, so that's the initial. Uh, Mags, I'm not how am I on time? I'm OK. Okay, good, good. <clears throat> um, so, so after three, four, five years, and I'm still kind of doing it today, obviously the book had to finish at some stage or the work had to finish. I began to get all of the material to get it. Like I'd been doing that as I went along as good researchers do, where you're consistently got digging in, you're going, what's happening? Why, why, da, 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 da. And you're going, fuck, I can't make any sense of any of this for a good period of time. And then you go, okay, maybe there's some shape here that I can put. And of course you put it on it yourself, right? So the book developed into a number of different chapters. Uh, one of them is around the idea of, I live here, but do I want to stay here, right? And why, if, why would I stay here or why would I leave, right? And so, Normally, that's just presented as, um, <clears throat> I just get on with it, will you? Do you know what I mean? Just make your choice and hurry up. And, but it's a deep emotional dilemma for, especially women with children, as to, so there are lots of things here that I want to hold on to. So I might have family here. I have friends here. I've, uh, my life was here. Um, and yet there are problems here. There's violence here occasionally, sometimes too much for my liking. There's drug dealing here. There, so there's this other side of the place that I don't like. So how do I, so the chapter became, should I stay or should I go? And it really just, did. so, but the whole conversation and that the whole chapter takes place within a diminishing public housing system uh, with people who have very limited options who don't have, can't just, don't even think about the idea that I can't purchase a house. It's not even in there, the thing that I can't purchase a house because I never knew what to purchase a house even meant. So ergo, my whole goal is how do I convince the housing officer to give me where I, to give me the house where I would like to go, okay? So you, like Bourdieu would call it a field, let's say. So you're operating in that field 
you meet these officials. Uh, I don't know whether people read Bourdieu's book on the state about the French Housing Commission in the 70s, and he talks about the role of officials within the field uh, as this kind of gatekeeper, right? So women particularly end up going to meetings all the time with council officials and pleading a case, right? And it's really like, I'd be, I haven't written much about it here, but it's something definitely that's really important in the sense of how does that happen? What happens? Obviously, Rory, you know, like the big problem behind it is that there's no stock, right? So a lot of the com conversations are, you know, there's not, there's not much of an outcome or if there is, it's going to take a long time. I met a woman yesterday who told me she'd just been given a corporation house of fingers after 16 years on the list, right? Now, I don't know what the average length of waiting on, on the list, but it's long, right? It's probably close to 10, I'd say. Um, so that chapter just developed around that, but there's, it's about how people go through the should I stay or go, should I, sh should I stay or should I go process? And there's a, obviously a reference to Colin's favorite band in there somewhere, The Clash, okay? If you know that song. Um, so the other pieces in the, um, the chapters that build are, so you meet people in their 50s who work in construction all their life. You meet, say, older men, uh, and they start telling you stories like, you know, yeah, I worked there, I did this, I worked there, I led strikes, I did all sorts of things in all sorts of places. And you begin to have a conversation, you start going back to the flat, you start going every day, every second day, and then this person gets a job back after seven years after of nothingness, effectively after the economic crash, and he gets a job back working for, lay for bricklayers on a site, and suddenly discovers my body is completely I can't, I just have suddenly come to the conclusion that my arms, my physical strength, my hands, my feet, my back can't take the pressure of lifting 400 blocks a day up and down scaffolding, in and out, running the boards, doing all that work. Um, so it's kind of very classic, very traditional uh, labor analysis, let, let's say, but at the same time, it's one of the one of my arguments would be is that it's almost like that doesn't really happen anymore. We don't we don't have people who work hard maybe in places like that. And all of a sudden you discover uh, the real deep physical emotional core to what happens to somebody who's spent, let's say, after the end of a working life. And then you meet younger people who are coming into it, who are muscled up, uh, who think they could lift eight hundred in the morning, right? Because they're doing the gym. From Friday, you know, and there's, and you kind of go, how long will that take before that body wears down? Do you know what I mean? But there's a real sense of enormous physical energy and physical strength in the younger people who go on to the same job, actually. Um, so th there's two of those chapters which look, the second of the work ethic chapters looks at not just paid work that people have been involved in, but especially at women who do a lot of unpaid work or the double day as it's called, is it Ernie Hochschild's phrase, the double day? So there's a double day, and a lot of women who live in the Bridgetown estate are separated, and they have children, one, two, three children, and Nadia's story in the second of the work ethic chapters kind of encapsulates that thing of the man just got up and left, left me with the kids, and the state still paid him the benefit. <laughs> this is mad for a significant period of time back in the day until eventually it got sorted. Um, but effectively, it meant that men's, in, men's interests are prioritized over women's interests, even in those separations. Um, <clears throat> so, like, I, uh, as a man, I, I, like, I don't know how good I am at writing that story, but it, what I would certainly like to think is that that's a critical part of class history, right? Its relationship with gender um, and how that works out in practice, because 70% of the tenants in the Bridgetown estate are women. Um, so, and I, I don't know what the overall public housing uh, lean is on that way. I think it will probably be similar. Um, you do have cases where men still live with their partners, obviously, but they're not on the floor because for various reasons, they either don't or don't, can't, don't want to pay rent, let's say. So um, slowly the book develops into all of these, uh, the, like there's, maybe the, those three chapters, and then the book goes off in a different direction, which effectively says, so we've kind of been in that station for a while, and now we're going to follow this group of people here who go to the religious house, 
they talk about how things are for them on a daily basis in relation to basic things like what the price of toilet rolls is, uh, how much clothes are, how are they going to manage from one end of the, of the week to another. Um, so there's a real, yeah, me like, um, it, I don't know about that thing about how normal it becomes, say, to go to uh, a food bank, right, for want of a better phrase, like the religious house is effectively a food bank. The, di the difference with religious institutions and I think secular food banks is that there's a little bit of uh, pull on your religiosity to say, will you please join the congregation? Or if you're coming here, we have certain expectations. Um, but as we know, food banks in general have grown exponentially. And uh, is it Garthwaite is the woman's name? Is it Hillary Garthwaite? Britain has written about them. So like, it's almost like they're, be they're becoming <clears throat> very quickly part of the fabric, as if that's just like, so you go to different shops and then the, there's the food bank and we go, okay, how did that get here? And what does that mean? So um, there's just something about the transition of more and more people into those spaces over time. And even, so the state, did the state really care when certain sections were in them? And no, it didn't. Um, so yeah, um, Thematically, uh, there's there, the last two ethnographic chapters of the book. One is called Fragile Beings. And for me, it's about the breaking down of minds and bodies. So um, I didn't expect kind of this to be part of the story, but part of the big story for, for sitting with people was, why don't you go on disability, right? Or why are you not on disability? And so somebody would say, uh, I don't really understand what it means, but maybe I should be on it. And someone else saying, no, I will never go on disability because that says something about me that I'm not, for instance, right? But the real issue sitting beneath that for me was the breaking down of bodies and minds over time, let's say, where people, um, like one of the people who, who's uh, in the ethnography, consider, like diabetes, consistently going to the hospital, uh, potential amputations, so this change state of affairs very quickly where you go, Jesus, how, how is that going on? And then he goes, I need more to be done. I need more to be done. Uh, people who are in institutions and who can't even explain to you what that was, right? So you're kind of going, so you, like, unless you were to go back and say, was this person in your institution and what happened um, during that time? Because, People just, they, they uh, whatever that is, they have a very condensed understanding of what happened to them and they can't articulate it. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, so um, yeah, th there's um, the last eth ethnographic chapter is called The Word, right? Um, like there's something about language and power and for, like obviously I'm quite a James Joyce, I'm interested in Joyce and Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake and all that, but there is maybe at a very simple level, a richness and a real creativity in the way people try and understand, articulate, uh, live every day through language, right? So um, in terms of how they tell stories, how they talk to each other, how they um, explain, describe. And uh, like the, the opening piece of that chapter is that we're in a church in the city at a funeral of a man who one of the women had known very superficially in a way, but we went and the woman who was with me is saying they're all very nice here. And it's a kind of one of those moments where she really feels out of place in this very opulent church in the city center. Um, and the priest gets up and says, Jesus had a nickname, right? And I kind of, the two of us go, did he really have a nickname or to each other on the benches? I was going, do you know what it is? Or do you, you know, it's kind of absurd moment. And he says his nickname was the word, right? And I'd never heard Jesus had a nickname called the word before that, but I believed him. And it, but then it kind of, you kind of go, if you, like it's kind of it's quite an interesting idea about how does the word like when you go back and read some what you've written down that day, I go the word is actually crucial to the pe people's lives on the Bridgetown estate, whether it's the bingo, 
whether it's the sitting around trying to say, you know, uh, make sense of the world, right? If you're just trying to make sense of why, what's going on here? Why is this? Um, so anyway, like one, which probably brings me into these uh, part of the story of the word really is these phrases that people use, um, which one of them became the book type. So it's not where you live, it's how you live and what goes around comes around. And we've had some conversation about which of them should have been the book title in the past, but it's not where you live, it's how you live became the title of the book. Um, so in a way, like I, when you read other ethnographies, you go, Jesus, like that's amazing how that, but that's one of these eureka moments where people keep using this in the recorded conversations, not loads and loads of times, but consistently somebody would say to you, it's not where you live, it's how you live. And after all, you go, okay. And so you say to somebody, what does that mean? And they go, well, we don't get, we don't get anything because we live here and there's kind of surface level ex explanations, right? Um, but we, I'm not saying that I have as the kind of definitive, definitive interpretation of how they should understand their own lives, but really this thing about um, we can transcend the place we live in, right, somehow by wearing the right clothes, by having the proper accent, by being the right person, uh, having the right decorum when we go to events, and by, you know, appearing publicly respectable, right, so there's really good stuff written by people like Beverly Skaggs on the ideas of respectability. So it's not where you live, it's how you live, is imbued with this problematic of respectability. Am I respectable? Do I appear respectable to other people? And what the, the phrase says is, yes, I do. But what it also says is, I don't really know whether I do or not, right? Because there's always a worry and a fear in the background that actually, I'm not really sure whether, and, and a lot of the actions would say that people don't go into places where they would test that that much anyway. Um, what goes around comes around was kind of a mad phrase, but we were in a person's flat one day and she had a tattoo on her arm, right? And I kind of went, uh, that's, that's just fucking mad, that is, right? Um, but it's like um, cliche, aphorism, morality tale, uh, myth, uh, whatever you take your pick, right? So you kind of go, so it's a bit like, so there was this mad bloke who used to still want, he might be locked up at the moment. He, one of the things he did one day was, there was a woman leaving her flat and he said, get in your car and drive me into town, right? And he just would, uh, and another day, Rosie in the book, he went into her flat and tried to rob her boy, brother's bicycle and she fought with him in the hall and said, no. And he did leave, right? Because she put it up to him. But um, what, so one of the phrase, so what goes around comes around is like this inexorable morality tale, let's say, that it will work out in the end, right? So we're sitting on the steps one day and I, I don't know, like stupidly go, uh, but the bank's people, it, what, what, if you're saying what goes around comes around, did it really happen for the people who did all that stuff for, on us from the banks? And Rosie says back to me, but they didn't really hurt people, John, did they? Right? And of course, you just fall into a hole when you hear that, don't you? And you go, for, for you know what I mean? Anyway, so but, what's, so, but what's really interesting is when you dig in, there's a kind of, like, so my thing is that there are critical windows into how people understand the world, right? And most times, and in most places, people are not interested or haven't got the time legitimately in many cases, but most of the time what we read about public housing doesn't get that bit, let's say, right? Rationality, what is the ration? How, how do people rationalize the lives that they have? So the way they rationalize them is by saying things to you like, it's not where you live, it's how you live, John, right? So I'm a good person. What comes around goes around. So Doobie's gonna get what's coming to him. I can tell you that. I think we may well get what's coming to him, um, but there's a kind of, you know, justice, it's maybe justice at a local level and so on. So anyway. Okay, look, I mean, it, um, let me have a little drink of water. So that's all of this. That's for me just talking about how the book shapes, how the shape came to take the shape that it did. Um, the part for me at the end was, 
I think the book is experimental. Like, I think I have a lot of work to do to develop the ideas that are used in the back of the book, which say, and maybe the, the important phrase taken from Roy Bhaskar, the late British critical developer of originator of transcendental critical realism, where he says, we need to go from the man manifest phenomena. So what we see and experience in the events and actions are everything you've just said, right? Let's say if he was talking to me, and we need to go to the generative structures, right? So what was it that produced all of the things you're telling me? Why, like, you know, whether it's prices, death, as in DBT, uh, what what are the are there or maybe you're a complete phenomenologist and you just stick with the story world, right? That that's the only reality which exists, right? We, uh, which is effectively what phenomenology would say that that's the only real reality. There's nothing else, right? That we can we live in a consistent phenomenological construction moment to moment, that, and that's how the world is. But the realist argument that the book that I'm making in the back of the book is saying actually. There are key generative structures and mechanisms and processes which come down to things like policy decisions, right? So loads and loads and loads of policy decisions that Mary usually writes about brilliantly were made 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, that all loads of us here saw. Sometimes we had two budgets in a year. They couldn't get them, they couldn't kick us enough, let's say, right? So they were saying uh, youth benefits, let's take 50 off that. What was the next one? Uh, traveler, uh, child welfare. Let's take something off that. Let's take, so all of these, the, the mechanism was, so the, we had a financial collapse and then all of these other things rolled out. But when you get to the ground level, it's hard, people don't find it hard to grasp the lock between the two things, right? So the, the, the end of the, the, the second part and in the introduction to the book is arguing to say the mechanisms and processes that roll out, make life what it is. I don't, I don't know what percentage you would put on it, but they have a significant influence in terms of how life is in that place. So for instance, something very stupid like a maintenance department for the city council, right? There's none, they've taken them out in most parts of the city. So we end up in these, in places which could be really well maintained to a really high standard, but the policy was, no, we don't do maintenance. <laughs> Actually, we say on the office there's a maintenance sign, but actually there's nothing really in the office, and so on. So there, ergo, the place deteriorates, and somebody goes, what happened there? Jesus. And you go, well, actually, there was no maintenance for 25, 30 years. That's what happened. And they go, oh, that must have been the paper before us, so, and, uh, and so on, right? So, look, that's me, maybe me, Mags. That's the, yeah. Thanks, John. And I mean, it's, it's actually when, when I was asked to do this, I was thinking to say, this, that's a very, very hard book to respond to. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do my best here just with, with a series of thoughts, really. And, and first of all, to welcome that work and you know, to echo the, the, the sense that there's not enough of it. Um, it's really creative and it's so interdisciplinary in terms of the range of disciplines that you draw on. It's a really good example of, of that. And um, it reminded me that Kathleen O'Neill is telling it like it is, yeah. which was the story of what class life in Kilgarry. Um, that's what it reminded me most of. And the gap in between those types of books in terms of the loss of the knowledge that we mm. captured had there been more work like that. Um, and I suppose Kathleen Lynch in your launch spoke about the need for an exit on the for marginalized voices and the idea that you know that the, the state could, could sponsor through the university. A mechanism to enable the voice of those kind of communities to come through further. And you mentioned being on the grave yourself. But it did, yeah. me, that's to some degree what he was quite good at doing. And you know, Vincent Farrell died recently as well of this parish as well. So th th yeah. there's a lot of legacies to draw on that maybe we could think of in, in terms of how we could do this better as, as an institution. It struck me this morning as well, and um, the Stardust uh, inquest mm -hmm. started this morning. And I'm from Coolock originally, and it really struck me of it was the uh, one of the Keegan sisters was talking on the radio this morning about how that was just pure class issue in terms of the injustice that those families experienced and the the, the, the length of time it took to bring it to, to justice. And I remember just growing up in school, I was in the Dean class 
in the year that the star just happened. And in my school, it was a very mixed school. There was a lot of kids from Bonnybrook and Kilmore, and then there were kids from what we called the purchased houses um, in and off the Monohyde Road. And if you were from the purchased houses, you went to the Grove and you kind of listened to hippie-ish mm. kind of music. And if you were working class, you went to the Stardust. And most of the kids who were killed in the Stardust actually were in the tech and the class to do it. They weren't actually in my school. But the working class kids who were in my school, some of whom were injured and stuff like that, we lived very different habitus in terms of how you were describing it in the book. So a, a lot came back to me in terms of thinking that through. And I suppose it's where I, I really began to understand what class meant. In, in terms of, I, I looked, like I saw it in the experience of the South Stardust very, very quickly. It probably inspired me to study sociology in some respects. I think that the book is very much a book of two parts, as, as you described it there. There's the epigraphic stories, mm -hmm. and there's the beginning and the end in, in terms of wrapping the theory around it. And it, it's very theoretical. There's immense depth in the book, and I wanted to try and draw out on some of the pieces that spoke to me and from both my life experience and work, but also my research. And I suppose it's probably worth saying, um, you know, I, I before I started in the university, I worked in the National Organization of College and the Vincent de Paul, but I also worked in Utrecht, where I was working with early school leavers. And by coincidence, some of those early school leavers came from Bridgetown. So I used to sometimes have an occasion to work down there. And like the book really talked to that experience. You talk about, you know, the danger of spatial fetishism, and I, I totally agree with you. But you also talk about that example you gave of the man not being able to do the building work anymore, and about the embodiment mm -hmm. of poverty and the, the hard life. But I remember calling up early school leavers and demanding, like, get your granny to come and see me, or you're, you know, you're going to lose your face. And actually, when the granny would arrive, on her, on her face was embodied poverty. You know what I mean? You just, you didn't even have to have a conversation. The minute you saw the woman, you realised, I see your story, I see your life, and you could, you could really contextualize the child's life and how fragile, as you said, the fragile beings that were there. But you also talk in the book about the sense of territory, the safety of space, mm. um, when you're from somewhere like that. And on page 128, you say, people rarely stray from the class, class tracks and zones. And it reminded me that we spent an awful lot of time in that new beach project, simply trying to get the kids to cross the tunnel bridge. Like that was like a major okay. learning objective. Was literally, and, and often we failed. We couldn't get them to cross the tunnel bridge because the, the territorial importance of knowing their space and knowing where their habitus was, what was so important to them. And I remember my own family, I went to Trinity, and I, for the first couple of years, just trying to get my mother to go into the grounds of Trinity because she was afraid. You know, she, she knew she didn't belong there, she knew she wasn't mm -hmm. always there. And um, so, like, it, it is that part and no part of the space of the class city of it. I think that's very important. The book is actually, it's really philosophical. And I think my, my favorite bits that I really liked and appreciated was you talking about reciprocity and interdependency and how bad that value you mm. lived out on the estate. Um, and I, I think that that's really important to, to really emphasize that that is a really underpinned value of people's lives. But you also talked about freedom and the need to reclaim the concept of freedom from a neoliberal concept. And I really like that. The idea of freedom as a collective freedom mm -hmm. rather than an individualized or a, a rational man mm -hmm. kind of freedom to do what you want it's freedom in the context of your mutual obligations to others um, and you talked about the flourishing of each other is a condition to the flourishing of all i really like that um, and myself like in, in my own book create a leap of social welfare i talk about freedom from the market mm -hmm. is, is a form of freedom that we need to talk about more in terms of what we want to do, that freedom is very societal. So a lot of the book, it, it speaks really well to class and gender. And you asked yourself a minute ago, what well, was it appropriate or, or were you doing well enough as a man telling that story? I, I think you do it very well in the book. It's really clear how, how women dominate the effective domain of care. And um, it's really clear that class and gender, as you argue in the book, it just can't be captured by narrow definitions and so the quantitative methods, that qualitative mm. story of how people live their lives, the strong sense of the ethic of care that comes through in the book, Max's idea of care consciousness, the feminization of class, of poverty and of social housing, and the nature of patriarchy, all that is, I think it's really well written in the book. I think there's a lot about care that's really good, and particularly that focus on the need to keep care, care as a public and a social good, to, mm. to keep reminding ourselves that 
it has to be socially valued. And indeed, following Bunn and myself, which we work at the moment with Family Carers Ireland, looking at how we can value family care work and recognise and reward it in a more meaningful way than the carers allows us to at the moment. Um, there's a really interesting discussion in the book about whether care and family, the care, particularly family-based care, can ever really be fully commodified and yeah. the distinguish between care for and care about. And, and I think that, that's really true. There's some really deep like, insights there about care that I really liked. And then, of course, there's the stories of lone parents and the dominant mm -hmm. experience of lone parents, the amount of unpaid care they do, along with the amount of paid work mm -hmm. that they do in the male resident of work still. And for me, what was absent in those stories was how little there was self-care in all of that, yeah. how little they cared or yeah. had the opportunity to care for themselves. Yep. For instance, parents. And, you know, some of those stories in class and gender were experienced through the welfare system. I don't know if Pauline uses the concept of bureaucratic violence or you've got your street level bureaucracy. And those types of stories of how people work in the field of welfare and yeah. try and negotiate that space. And there's that concept within stigma theory of claims stigma. Um, and I think just how the welfare system colours people's experience of life. There's some nice new work coming through there from the likes of Joe Whelan and Philip Finn looking at um, the lived experience of welfare and walking alongside as almost an ethnographic okay. methodology um, pioneered by Ruth Patrick in the UK. But there's some nice Irish work coming through now for the first time that I think is really trying to walk alongside people's welfare experiences and record it and make sense of it, which is, which is nice. I, it's really clear, as you said it there, that those internal conversations on the ethical struggle people have to flourish, the should I stay or should I go question, yeah. is often in the context of the care they have for the next generation. Mm. And they're not making those decisions for themselves. They're mm. trying to say, right. what's the best thing to do for my kids, for my grandkids? Mm -hmm. um, and it really makes you kind of wonder about if you really did value the care that they were showing for their own children and grandchildren and their wider community, and what policy would you put in place to respect and value that and to valorize it? Um, and it shows me the importance of that policy imagination. You, you talked about the um, the language, the words, and with those two things, what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. and it's not where you live, it's how you live. Um, and I was thinking of um, it's my mother's anniversary today, so I was thinking this morning of a lot of her sayings, uh, love many, trust you, always have your own view, <laughs> what was the favorite? Uh, what's for your own passion? Yeah. Uh, be careful, she's the consequence, which was great kind of warning Jesus. signal. Um, <laughs> what was the fourth one? Be, uh, be careful, she's the consequence. Okay. I know this. <laughs> uh, change the things you can, accept the things you can. But like they, they are all life's lessons, aren't they? Those types of things. They're, they're how you make sense of the world you're in and how you teach the next generation down how to make sense of yeah. the world you're in, how you form your own habitus. So I mean, I think there's loads more we could do with that. Like yeah, the, the, yeah the, there's the, a book on that, isn't that right? There is, there is for sure. <laughs> I think so there that is. making sense, um, enabling people to make sense, how we form our habits, our understanding of being. I, I think there's so much in that that's really nice. And yet you're arguing about being is lived in, in time and space. I think that's really important. Tony Fitzpatrick talks about time and space deprivation or temporal and spatial deprivation. And how busy people's lives are, even though they're not working, just how busy they are surviving. And I don't know, you remember the IMU book, Working for Work? I think it's yeah. the 13th edition, the first yeah. edition was 1994. But the first line in that book is, sometimes being unemployed is the hardest job of all. It's a 24 mm seven -hmm. life. And it's that sense of, you spend most of your time just trying to keep your claim going, trying to put food yeah. on the table. Yeah. You know, just the, the work of, of the space of time. And, one thing Pauline and I are looking at that again in that family care Ireland research, the time spent navigating the system of the state to be yeah. able to claim what should be legitimate claims in, in terms of what you need. Um, I think you talked at the very end there about, about you know, the, the role of policy and in, in structuring mm. and the reality of that life. That's not phenomenological, it's 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 structured, and um, but that there's always power to affect that structure. And I think it's a very nuanced discussion of social reality where you talk about structural power is very evident and we only see it when it's manifest and, mm. and it, it's clear what impact it's having. Often it is quite invisible, but it has profound effects. But you're also really clear that there's agency and that there's culture mm. there that helps the agency to emerge. 
and that outcomes are never really predetermined. So yeah, mm. I think you strike a really nice balance in that debate about structure and agency. So you talk about, okay, people do reduce inequality and the, the system mm. makes you do that, but they also transform social structures mm. and, that, and sometimes it works. So I think the book is really, it's, it's very hopeful in, in that respect. Um, and I think it, it draws on like Rebecca Salmon's work open the dark and not too late. I think that there, there's a lot of focus at the moment in the context of some of the great societal challenges we have, including climate change, on trying to, to be, get a better understanding of hope. And I think your own work is, is evidence of that all around you, like your, your use of the arts, your political campaigning over the years. So I think, you know, the, I think the book is, it's a very political book and hope is a very political position to take in, in that in terms of both at a micro and a macro level. So to attend with your own, the power of the people exists in the demos and the book is a vibration of hope. I, I think I think that's really we need books like mm -hmm. that. That tell the truth, but that tell it in a way yeah. that don't be fatalistic and that still leave room for that transformation at the end of it is really important. So I think Mary, that's to, to... Rory. Uh, thanks, John, and thanks, Mary um, and Mags. Um, and to echo um, what Mary said, I think the book is a really, really important um, contribution to understanding um, working class communities, understanding public housing, and most importantly, I think that it is, an, it is a form of resistance in and of itself, because it is a statement that these communities, working class people matter mm -hmm. and deserve to be, you know, involved, engaged, studying and all that. And it was something when I was reading it and that struck me again. And I suppose, you know, we know each other a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're 20 years now, um, friends. Sometimes, I know, friends always, but uh, <laughs> it probably feels longer, yeah. It's 20 years since I first went up to uh, Fatima Mansions in Dalton House and met you guys when I was doing my research, my PhD starting out. Um, and, you know, then I went in working in Dalton House with you um, and the others, you know, intimately for the six years. And in the book, I see all the people at Dalton House, you know, it was a similar the stories, the experiences, and, and I was there during austerity and, you know, saw those things as they were happening to people and as they were living it. Um, and you recount it and describe it really, really well. And I think it's an important, um, a really important documentation. And there is, you know, academic papers have been written on this, what is called the lived experience of austerity mm -hmm. and neoliberalism. And you really give that um, and I think that's really important because so much of the analysis of what happened or even what was happening never actually goes back and looks, well, what did it mean for people? You know, what was the real human impact yeah. of these policies, these decisions? Um, and you really capture that. And I think it's a really important um, documentation and evidence and of what was the real life impact of both austerity and neoliberalism. Um, there was a number of things, you know, and I suppose that question of, um, you know, the, the the generative structures that you talk about, and, you know, you have them interwoven within it. But I suppose I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how much sort of that public housing and policies and ideology towards public housing shaped those experiences. And I do think that they were very, very significant, like they're massively significant um, factors that influenced people's lives and their outcomes and these phenomena that you refer to. Um, and it's interesting because there are lots of conversations that we had through, through our work. And there was, I think, in a way, you know, I was trying to think of different ways to think about it. And, you know, they're referred to, and you talk about this, like places of deprivation, and actually what you do always is you deconstruct those concepts and challenge them fundamentally. And the idea, you know, you say that deprivation, it's not communities that are deprived, but it's society 
that has deprived the communities of the resources, mm -hmm. of the opportunities. And I was thinking, as you were, you were talking about it, the launch, the launch your book, you know, you, you made the point very well. And I was thinking about, because you talked about, you know, communities almost have to prove how deprived we are yeah. in order to get the resources. And you could, I was thinking, you know, throw it back and say, well, actually what we need is not indicators of deprivation, but indicators of exploitation. Mm -hmm. And go to the institutions in our society, the structures, the Fox Rocks, the banks, and go, well, how much exploitation is being done of these communities in those places? Mm -hmm. And that was just a, a thought I had around that. But it, it's trying to, you know, I suppose, back up what you're saying, you know, that it's absolutely so important to challenge because so much social policy, so much sociological <clears> research <throat> is all about deprivation, disadvantage. And we have to completely challenge that. that yeah. You know that it is both the structural cause, but also people themselves have so much. Um, because what happens is then these places are thought of as deprived. And when you look at what happens, social housing, the, the policy narrative and discourse and societal one. And I was actually going through the years when you go back to it. It was the 1980s when neoliberalism started and said essentially social housing has failed. Yeah, it's over. So we're 1980s. 1990s continued, 2000s intensified through public-private partnerships into the 2010s, austerity continuing that 40 years, you know, of undermining, mm -hmm. of not investing. And, and of course, as I talk about in GAFs, it wasn't social housing that failed. It was society, the economy that failed social housing mm -hmm. and social housing communities. Um, and that they more than failed they actively destroyed them. Mm -hmm. And that was something as well that you taught me. And, you know, it's, it's visible in the book as well. This active destruction of these places that society did not value. And what they did value was the land. Absolutely. And you always talked about that. The land in these places had suddenly become valuable during the Celtic Tiger years. And the communities that lived on them, these people, the stories you tell that are so important, were given no value whatsoever. And so they were to be dislocated, uh, removed from their place. And this is where, you know, the, the what you draw on in it of the Fevre and because my geography, geography mm -hmm. background, mm -hmm. you know, looked at that and, and gave me the insights as well as you show the importance of place, that these places, irrespective of what conditions people are living in, is still their home. It's still their place. It's still their community. Mm -hmm. And even particular, particularly for working class communities, people who are dealing with multiple challenges, as you described, the only place they have known, that the dislocation from those places has a traumatic impact deeply and it leaves people very isolated. And what was, you know, within policy and within practice of the Irish state, it placed no value on these communities. And your book, I think, is a real challenge to that, that actually they are as worthy of value as any citizen, as any person is. And they should be valued as equal citizens, but they're not. And mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, you know, in terms of the, the concept that you're talking about and the phrase, what goes around comes around is really interesting because what neoliberal what the neoliberal utopia is that people internalize that completely mm -hmm. and as you said when you ask you know oh should the banks uh should they didn't do any harm to anybody mm -hmm. and that is the new neoliberal utopia that those in work class communities completely accept this is the way it is, that it's my fault, mm. it's my responsibility, it's what I have done. Um, and what's interesting and comes out in the book and it's in the research is what the health impacts yeah. of living in poverty, of living in poor housing. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about, you know, do the structures influence the phenomena that we see? Health is one of the biggest areas where it is shown that living 
in poverty with chronic stress, not having control over your life, um, and the experiences of feeling less than is actually has physical and mental health impacts that impact us. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is, is shown and it's something that um, is really important. And I think that um, the, the other point I was, I was thinking about was because the book is so intellectual, I love it. Like I love your really deep intellectual bits you go into and you know you talk about all of it. Um, you know, the different frames of thinking, and, and I think it's brilliant, and I, and I love that, and I think that's what you should work more on, because you have so much to offer uh, in that, in challenging our whole thinking, and I was uh, trying to, you know, think that, because you, of course, you, you always bring up the dialectic, and, you know, it's like every time I see the dialectic, I have to go back and, you know, Google it, <laughs> what the hell does that mean again? Uh, even as a Marxist, you know, it's like, uh, where exactly does that fit, and where does that, that go, but you, of course, bring it up, and it's interesting because I was thinking about it that because there is a deep dialectic in defending places that you know need massive change mm. and then resisting the change that's an offer because it doesn't offer change that will benefit the places and people who are in them. And yeah. there's a huge process of, you know, and it's that dialectic, that challenge of how do you push for major change while also maintaining what is there um, and it's almost like these communities are utopias while also dystopians yeah. that within them contains possibilities of a, a different society you know of valuing valuing care valuing public housing not you know profit not being in it you know the, these you know you talk about the supports financial supports within communities and yet also of course they are forms of dystopia as well but the dystopia is more the discourse from policy yep. than it is the reality of what people are living. Um, and it just was was that uh, to, you know, you mentioned the Joyce and stuff. I think that to finish, um, like I think it is like this Joyce and celebration of working class communities and public <coughs> housing, but also a critique of how inequality um, creates the deprivation. And I think that there's so much that we need to learn from you and learn from that and value um, and hopefully change as there is this change underway in valuing working class community with valuing public housing. So thank you. Nice and hearty. I might just come back in there. It's, it's hitting quarter past three. So we did want to do a little bit of questions and answers. Now, there's so much to unpack there. I'm not going to even try. It's somewhere around because there's just too much to unpack. And I'm sure John would love to respond to that. But just in the interest of time and respect of your time, people getting buses and getting back to kids, we can do that. But I mean, that's, that would be fantastic because we've both raised. No one goes to the roost anymore, do they not? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're okay, John, unless you Oh, absolutely. Time, no way of talking enough. I'm done. If anyone has any questions, we're going to keep it tight enough that we can leave it here definitely quarter to three. Quarter, quarter to four. Quarter to four. It's quarter to half ten. If anyone has any questions, and um, for any of our speakers. Yep, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm curious, you were speaking of, and maybe this has been your experience too, um, I'm working with early school leaders at the moment and also the teachers to kind of understand what's going on there. And what was so interesting to me, talking about replicating poverty and, and replicating um, deprivation, that the kids, are so aware of how class and poverty plays a role in what they see as not them leaving school, but them being pushed out of school. And so, and understanding this concept of I'm being pushed out of school because they don't want me there. I go to a posh school, the teachers don't like me, they know my family, so they assume that I am this way. So I have to. But the state and the public policy, all they see is a child that is refusing to go to school. They're labeled as a behavior problem, maybe just look at fault, and there's all this kind of individualization of this problem child. And the kids are so aware and can articulate these kind of uh, systems of oppression and systems of class and power. And then I talk to the teachers, and the teachers are not once do this class come up. There's a lot of discussion of there's a lot of problems at home, and that's why they're not going to school. 
And I was kind of struck with how little discussion there is of there's a potential maybe that there's something going on in the classroom in the school that is causing children to leave. And you mentioned like when you're talking to people, you know, bring up the banks and they'll say, no, the banks mm -hmm. are fine. They do nothing to me. Uh, so where do you see your role as kind of obviously you're a researcher and you don't want to muddy the waters of your data by offering your opinion sometimes. Um, but how do you navigate those places where you see people kind of missing missing what you see as this massive structure or there's kind of a gap in in their understanding. Do you offer your opinion? Do you have a conversation about that? Or do you just kind of note it in your field and notes like, oh that's interesting. We kind of I'm trying to say, Mag is the education sociologist, is that fair? Um, <clears throat> but um, I think it's a good, really interesting question because it's like the example about sitting on the step and someone says, but the banks didn't hurt people, did they, John? Right? And you want to get sick over the back of the step. And, but, but that happens all the time, right? So, like, even now, some of the people, like, recently, like, you know, would say things to you like, we've got to house our own force, right? And you've got a real dilemma because you're going, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> we had a massive, like, so there's so many, you know, I think sometimes, um, like, there's a famous American study by Lapierre is about where uh, this Chinese couple are trying to book a hotel in America and the Chinese guy rings up and says to the people, I'm Chinese with my wife and we want to book, and like, 80 or 90% say no, right? And then they go around America in a car together and nobody refuses them bar the odd hotel here and there, right? So they discover that uh, like the people don't do a lot of the time what they say, right? I know this is kind of around the houses. And um, so even, so I would, like I know, for instance, that if, um, let's say people say, say asylum seekers, refugees, people, you know, whatever color, nationality, were in conversations in those places. I know they would treat, they would be getting them tea, making them this, giving them that, right? And that, so there's something about the testing of those things, right? Like, I mean, the basic answer to the education question is that it's completely completely classed, right? And that it filters down to that level and they what effectively the state does go, Mary, you deal with the shit, will you? In you preach, or Rory, you deal with it when the parent comes into the community project, or Mags, you deal with it when they come into the youth project. So, and we, like, we haven't, you, do you know, like, I mean, you, and you listen to the, like, the television yesterday, the day before, they go, we're the most educated people in the world, right? And you go, really? Where? Right, I, I mean, <laughs> No, do you know what I mean? You're going to go, actually, that's not really what the story is around here. And uh, so there's just, uh, there's this kind of diff tracks running in opposite directions. Um, but I, I think, like, it's really, like, I'm beginning to think about trying to work on a book about race and immigration, and I've started already, but I don't know whether it will ever become anything. Uh, and it's like, yeah, so you're going, you know, the kind of, the, on the surface anyway, it's the, was it Ireland for the Irish? What do they call themselves? Oh, Ireland's full, those people, right? And then we have Ireland for all, right? Uh, which they're kind of sound similar, aren't they? <laughs> but but so um, we're going to go in, like, and at the moment, like a lot of the, the stuff that's being driven is coming, it's being driven inside working class communities, strategically by a few actors who are doing certain things. So. Uh, like in a way, um, w like I think there are obviously lessons um, that we can learn from the north in terms of conflict about how we're going to, how are we going to walk that through, right? So what are we going to go? No, fuck all yous over there. We're not talking to yous anymore, and we're because that's not going to work, right? Because actually, it's the people who are in the book who will probably be on the side of. Why has my niece been on the housing list for 12 years? And suddenly, you know, everybody else is getting a house and a car and a this. Do you know what I mean? The mythology just cranks up. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know whether it really answers your question, but the, in the research process, I think 
it's you've at some level I wouldn't you know the way this there's a real problem dialectically as Roy says with judgment because uh, like in community based work and community based youth work you're always told to be non judgmental right that's one of the, I was thinking around the car for somebody's coming out here but part of the problem is what do you do if somebody's openly racist right so do you go so I think maybe in the research it's the story comes first. And like, do you know what I mean? There's plenty of people who do the judging, right? But politically, we become different people in terms of whether we're on the streets on a Saturday, um, going to the recent demonstration where we had very significant, that Rory spoke at, at the customs house, right? Where there was really significant, say, resistance to those ideas. And it seems they've we've diminished them somewhat, right, in terms of their capacity. So, but uh, but it would be like I would think it would be really interesting if somebody participated as a researcher, right? Maybe people tell me the, uh, in the, uh, the Ireland is full movement, right, with the Derek Lloyds of this world and what's his, Philip Dwyer's and all those people, right? It would be like it would be really useful to say why do you what what's what's going on there. Do you, do you know what I mean? And maybe, like, I'm not, I, you know, it's um, it's not about uh, what's the word, you know, saying y- your your viewpoint is as valid as anybody else's. It's a, there's something about getting inside it. Yeah, like there's a brilliant book guy on the radio about being in the National Front in England last six months ago. Anyone here? Wrote a brilliant book about like beating women and children at one of his first national front. They, they were a uh, national anti fascist group, group in London, uh, anti fascist group were meeting and they just attacked anybody and beat them physically to a fucking pulp. And he then eff- effectively worked for the police for a number of years. But and t- like, so you kind of, when you hear him on the radio, you go, that's not a research project, you know, that's just a, a, a sensation story and possibly is, but actually. It was an, what you really got was this other thing that you don't normally have. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I definitely, yeah. I, if I'm a people, I wouldn't. You, you know, sometimes you go, you lose the plot, <laughs> but generally you try and you keep those relationships working to do the research. So write that book about those young people. Yeah, um, my name is Tom. I work in public education and education. Um, I both spoke and some masters, which I'll well, know research like it. My question is really around uh, did you see any signs of kind of collective organizing within the community, either within the workplace or as a community, or even memories of struggles that might have for the culture now? I know there's a nice discussion around mm. union activism mm. and how that continues, but I just wondered was that is there any sign of a sense of resistance? I would say probably no, Tom, at that, at that level. Um, but what you have is these kind of always a residue of where people who are like Frank in the book, you know, was a leader on the one of the, he worked in one of the technological companies for a while and he led a picket there. And he was like, he talked about going, like he didn't, he wasn't, uh, He'd go to the Marxism conferences at that time, for instance, that were held in Dublin. Um, so there are people, and there are other people who've left, let's say, right? Like one of the interesting, uh, you know, the way you, you, um, you, you know people years later, they go, oh, I was from there, and they, they, you know, they've gone on, done PhDs or whatever. So, um, like, the, the, and I had no expectation that there would be any of that. There's, there's a kind of institutional structures of community-based organizations. I would say um, they've been wrapped up by the state in gaff and tape, right? That's what they've done to them. And sometimes they just were very willing to do that thing, right? But that's a problem across a lot of places, you know, and it's to do with kind of subtle state power about how it operates in terms of like back to the old funding thing. But I, I mean, at another level, you'd always be hopeful, right? Like it's kind of mad. Some of the people are not absolutely not political, but if I said, if, if I was saying there's a demonstration town on Saturday, they'll be there, right? And you kind of go, that's just mad. That pe-, like, cause they're looking for somebody. They're not looking, they're, they'll, if, if they think your activity is valid, 
people will, will go in, go to that space. So, um, yeah, it's really good. I mean, it's the deeper question of how do we deal with that education, politicization, and bring people into those spaces where they become, you know, self self uh, acting in the, in the sense of buying in and getting like the, the, like the war like the last real example probably we have is the water charges of that you know like everybody going oh mary's going i'm going you're going you're going and there was a little bit of that again four or five weeks ago in town where at the demonstration of the customs house where yeah. where people are saying this you know what i mean we're not we're not having that that you know stuff that's going on but we, we know that that's going to continue, I think, for a while. Are there other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Amelia. I really enjoyed that. I can't wait to talk next week. Um, you mentioned disability there earlier, and it just kind of struck me because um, I suppose my own research had been around mother and baby home institutions oh, and how women in those institutions spent so long there and then they would be sometimes in, in the records classed as having a disability because they were depressed or would be suffering with their nerves, they, these kind of things, and then moved from one institution to another, and, away, and mostly working class women. Um, and in a way, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, anyone in that given situation would be depressed, their children were forced to be removed from them, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just wondering, is it kind of used a bit as a cop out to actually look at into the social conditions that the individual is, is you know, is facing? Um, or is that something that you found came into your research at all? Or um, if you could just speak a bit more to, to disability. Yeah, look, I, I would say I don't know anything much about disability. But for me, what happened was people raised it as an issue. So, um, so there are some financial benefits to one disability that you don't get on general social welfare, okay? It sounds mad, you get a free television license, you get some extra fuel benefits, and I think you get some extra travel benefits as well. Now that mightn't seem big much, right? Uh, but people make rational decisions sometimes and think, okay, would I be better off on that than on this, let's say. And, and, and in cases, in that case, um, where there's a conversation going on in a room where one woman says to another woman who was in, you know what I mean, in what I think is an institution, right? It may have well been a daytime coming home. Um, but so, so the conversation goes something like, you should be on disability, right? So as a category, it's really in people's consciousness, let, let's say. Now, in terms of like, textbook you know say the fine graded definitions of say physical to men mental what what that means i'm just it's not it's not about that because i have no experience in that but what i'm saying is it's in the conversation and the discourse that people themselves are having within the class conversations let's say so they're like and i'm kind of going you know that that's kind of that keeps coming up right about uh, so, for instance, the other woman who's who's being told you should be on disability, she then the social welfare send her to CTAC. Is a CTAC? Is that what they're called? You know, on the south side, Bishop Street has become a kind of funnel for everybody. So, if you go down there mornings, you'll see loads of people queuing up for for group work, a la CTAC methodologies, right? where they're all being brought in. Um, but effectively, what the system was saying was. Uh, get back to work, right? Now, and what the other, what Rosie is saying to her is, he, she's effectively saying, you won't get a job because you haven't got literacy skills, you haven't got any written skills, or you haven't got any manual skills, let's say. So she's making that judgment, right? And she says to her, fuck you, who are you to be telling me that I'm like that, right? So it's a really robust conversation between people about the meaning of you know, impairment, ability, what I can do, what I can't do. And then, another, like one of the other people in the story, I is slowly becoming physically more disabled, like a hugely physically strong fella, right? Um, who would tell you, how, like, you know, he would be given all the jobs or lifting all the heavy shit on the jobs when he was in England. And so 
uh, he's having uh, bits of his feet amputated and things like that. So it's another sort of conversation for him, and it's going on right up until last week for me with him, about his kind of physical uh, diminution or, you know, decay, let's say, at that level. And so that for me, it's like I wasn't expecting, say, disability to be a big part of the conversation, but it certainly was a significant issue for people in, in the Bridgetown estate, that group of people. And you kind of go, and I, like, I, my thinking is, I don't really know what to do about that. Actually, I've no idea how, how, you know. So obviously we have potentially great practitioners who can offer all sorts of things, right? But again, we go back to what Mary said earlier about uh, not really a priority. Send her to SeaTac instead of going, this woman is not going to go, what the f are you sending her to SeaTac for? It's a completely, uh, you know, mad, she needs much deeper supports around literacy, emotional support, uh, there's that than just putting her into the institutional system of get back to work. So I, I don't really, I don't know whether that answers it to any extent. Like, uh, and yeah, good work on the, on the, on the research. Fair play to you. Or do you want to turn that No, no, I suppose you do, you do see so many people both know the parents and people and job seekers who have made rational kind of life decisions to move towards a disability payment in the absence of proper supports and in the face of more and more conditions that are forcing them to do very narrow types of CTEC. Yeah. So to some degree, that you, you can see the narrowing down of life possibilities by pushing people into what are really socially constructed categories that leaves them with a choice, but you go into those categories. So I think what you're what you were saying is yeah, you can label people X without looking at what's underneath the yeah, boundary beast. That's right. Yeah, so I, I certainly would see that so Thanks so much for. I absolutely loved your book. It's um, it's it's such a rich account, and it's taught me so much about the city and country I've gone for home for the last ten years. Um, I have a question of method to methodology more. So, at the start, I was really taken by what you were saying about you know researching what one perhaps shouldn't be researching, you know, and the importance importance yeah. of that. And, uh, you know, as a supervisor, um, you know, PhD supervisor, so these are the kind of directions you always want to push your, your students towards as well. Now, I'm thinking what, uh, based on your experiences, um, because you would have to, like the kind of ethnographic research that you would have done is not necessarily easy to navigate in the institutional, you know, ethics, yeah. you know, structures yeah. and so on. So my question is, <laughs> how would you advise, you know, emerging researchers who, who are aspiring towards research like yours? You know, how would you, in, you know, encourage and support them in navigating, you know, those kind of ethical, ethical issues that come, you know, with, the, you know, doing research that you necessarily kind of shouldn't be or is difficult to conduct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I just exist in a kind of space that hasn't been contaminated. Is that fair to say? Is that bad word? <laughs> as much, as much as, right? Um, because, you know, like, it, it is an issue for me about how people get treated and how we work with them and going back to them. So at the end of this process, like Bristol had the book, like Colin Pullo, we tried... Colin and myself, especially, were trying to find an Irish publisher, right? We had great difficulty. But as part of that process, I had to go back to people and say, and I was terrified, right? And if somebody, I, I used to say this, and say, they just, you know the way the sensitivities about what you can, uh, that you do not want to exploit people, right? To use, in, from our side, right? And that way, and at, at any level. And you, you do know sometimes that people might go, they mightn't fully understand the impact that this might have when it comes out and people go, is that you, right? And um, so th there's maybe there's two ways. There's a, there's a kind of very unregulated ethical ward which operates, say, on, on a principle of trust basis, 
which is kind of the world that I've been working in and with this, where you go back to people, you give them either a transcript or a thing, and I wouldn't say I probably failed in some ways on doing it as thoroughly as I should have done it with some people. Some people died during the making, the writing of the book that were central to it. Um, and so there's, there's, for me, that was the thing about going back and reading like whole sections to people. And then I'd say to people, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to read you and you go, I don't care. I know it's my life. Go, just tell me when it's done and we'll go to the whatever. And you're kind of going, oh, really? you sure now? You, you know? <laughs> and all of that thing about having your forms, you're filling them in, you're signing them off. Um, and you're just worried that somebody is going to pick somebody, say, like I was on Ray Darcy talking about the book about five days after the launch. And like, it's just people are interested. They want, the media wants to dig in to that sort of stuff, right, more and more. Now, I, I thought he was quite okay, but you're kind of getting, um, yeah. So I, I I don't know how the, I have an idea how the ethics systems work in UCD and here and how onerous they are but to the point of that things don't happen sometimes because people, they take so long and all of that sort of stuff. And uh, like, you know, I'm going to talk against myself. Maybe the state will set up and say, nobody can publish a book, no matter where you are, you know, <laughs> unless you come through the general ethics committee of the state, let's say, that doesn't only work in universities. Like, so how do you, what I'm, what I'm trying to work out is how, um, like, the, the, what comes to mind is Marx, right, who never worked as an academic, right, who wrote some of the most important stuff that, that's ever been written. He didn't do ethnography, but he was uh, putting potentially, and still to this day, explosive material into the public domain. But if he had to, had to go to an ethics committee, probably that had Weber on it, he would have said, <laughs> he would have said, Marx, you're not, we're not, that's not getting published, right? Um, maybe that's a bit uh, of a disservice to the Weberians in the realm. But anyway, um, great stuff on bureaucracy. But um, so, like, I mean, the, so the, the question really is, if you turn it around a little bit and say, what stories are really important that we need to tell? And how are we going to get those stories told? Like the story about the housing policy and the what's underneath it, right? Which we know is vested interests and they control the whole discourse and they run so like in the next general election, if we have a change of government, will the vested interest say to the new people, you don't run the state, we run the fucking state, right? So just get with your job and we'll tell you when to do and what to do and so on, right? I mean, we talk about this, that they, so, but the quest, so the quest, so then we're in this thing of we, so there are people in this room who write, think, act, uh, about all of those things who need to continue to do that. So Rory did a podcast with me recently. Um, Rory was in Venezuela for the World Social Forum when Chavez was in power. Was he in power at that time? So Slavo Zizek, who's a Slovenian philosopher who I, I'm interested in, loads of issues with some of the stuff he does, right? But his argument about Chavez was there needs to be, there needed to be a really strong critical opposition of Chavez on the left, right? To keep him on his toes to work out how they were going, what they were going to do with the fuel resources and so on and so on. Um, so how do we come all the way back around from that? It's really about writing the story. So um, like, you know, this is, um, I was listening to lectures on Sunday by Zizek on Hegel, right? And he had this idea that retroactively things change the past, right? Which is a mad fucking idea. So he says, uh, so Kafka, for instance, as a novelist says, changed the whole of fiction retroactively when he wrote these books that people look back and went, oh fuck, I now see Dostoevsky and everybody else in a different light. And I think Joyce is probably, I don't think Zizek is clever enough to read Joyce yet, but anyway, <laughs> right? Um, he, so Joyce certainly has done that thing, right? So what we need to be doing is is putting, is getting into the position of saying, so part of the problem is there are no histories of public housing in Ireland. Do you know what I mean? There's Joseph Brady's books. You know what I mean? There's a kind of small level of it, right? Um, we have people who write on class in Ireland, like Colin, Mary, Rory, uh, and but we have, like, where we need to develop that, that work. So 
what's the function of the research in, is the question in a way. And if the function of the research is to change the world, we have the methods just have to fit that, right? With, with respect and all of the things that need to be given to the people who give you their hearts and souls to, to get things like this done. So, yeah. Thank you, Secretary. So I have to come up just a quarter to next, unless there's a really important question you want to ask, or if Rory or Mary wants to come back in, we might just wind up. You know, just come back in with that last question, because I, I just want to really echo I think, what you were saying that the, I think the fundamental thing is to, not so much the research method and the ethics that go with the appropriate method, but it's asking the right question. And it's asking questions that are subversive and that have the power to be transformed, to evolve, and to reinforce the assumptions that are already there that need to be unpacked. So I, I do think it's about really drilling hard on why I ask that question. Why I don't even push it back at that. The method would follow them if, if we have the right question, in particular in the PhD context, where I think there, there has to be some limits and boundaries around it, probably. And um, I think we could, we could collectively do a lot more to ask hard questions that the world at all of our departments, I think, you know. Very briefly, um, and um, the other kind of pushing it even a little bit further is the participatory reaction research, and even going beyond you know ethnographic study to actually can you engage with communities in a way that is a process of empowerment and involving them in the research and also social change as well. So, mm -hmm. I think I mean, one more question, and then we will um, do. It's not a question, it's just a memory from the knowledge following from, from your question. But we can agonize and deeper in the lower system. And at the moment, John Lowe has been put there, and John was at pains to thank people and, you know, for assisting in this process. And I remember one of the women just interrupted you and went, We're so proud of you, John! <laughs> And in a sense, you got this sense of the book that are going, we better help this guy finish this blood book. <laughs> so, you know, it's a sense of there's a lot of action. That was after they drank all the wine, Nessa. Yeah, never done it. But I'll just say then on behalf of everybody, thanks for your contributions and particularly thanks to Dr. John Bissy for coming in, to Dr. Maury Heron and Professor Mary Murphy as well. So and a big thanks to Mags for setting it all up. Yeah.